Hello everyone and welcome to the first episode of 2023 here on the Farm Traveler YouTube channel. So for the first episode, I thought it'd be cool to chat with an online barbecue expert, Jess Priles, who is a meat scientist who has a bunch of social media platforms that she's on where she helps bust meat myths, where she showcases some great barbecue and cooking techniques and a lot of other stuff. So here is my interview with Jess, who has done a lot of stuff, including creating Hardcore Carnivore, the awesome seasoning line, which I'm definitely going to try. And we're going to talk about her background, how she went from Australia to Texas, um, some popular cuts of meat she likes, some of her tips and tricks in the kitchen, um, smoking different meats and stuff like that. And also some cool thoughts on hunting, meat science, and a bunch of other stuff. So hope you enjoy it. My favorite brand of knife is a Gerber, and I know you're an ambassador for them, right? Mm-hmm. That's awesome. I saw I saw your new knife. Isn't it like a new knife you work with them with where it's got like the like a pork um, kind of like diagram on it? Yes, it's a beef cut chart. So I'm the, I'm stoked for that. They call yeah, it our they, recipe. Like, so Oh, the recipe. Yeah. That's not bad. Yeah. Did, did Gerber like reach out to you for that or like how did that collaboration yeah, work? Yeah, it did. So I've been working with them for many years now and they're like, well, they have this custom program where you can choose select knives and put whatever you want on it. And they're like, we're getting like uh, some of our ambassadors to put together their custom recipe. So what their knife would look like. Um, and so, and the only way you can order that is through that link. So it's pretty cool. But you, okay, then, that makes but you then carry the exact same knife that I carry. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I had followed you, I think like two weeks before. And I was like, all these cooking videos are awesome. And then I saw you post with Gerber. I was like, I knew I followed her for a reason. <laughs> Um, so you you grew up in Australia, then you moved to the U.S. Yes. Like, tell us a little bit about kind of your background and how you got um, known as like this huge kind of barbecue chef online. <laughs> um, I it was really a trip to Texas that sort of kicked things off for me. Um, you, mm. When you come here, people make you go on barbecue like trails <laughs> as part of a tourist thing. So um, I had my first taste of barbecue and just absolutely fell in love with it, fell in love with Texas, kept coming back, kept eating more barbecue, wanted to learn more about it. Um, I'm not a chef by trade. I'm just someone who likes to cook. And I uh, ended up going home and trying to get a brisket in Australia and then realizing that the brisket that I was seeing in Australia was nothing like the brisket that I could find in America. But I was like, well, hang on a second. Why is that? Um, because I came from an urban city. I was not involved in ag. I did not know. I, I, I wasn't the type of person who could competent, confidently tell you the differences between steaks. And so mm, okay. unlocking barbecue unlocked an entire meat and ag world for me. It was really interesting. I bet. I mean, is there anything in Australia, like very common to barbecue here in the States? I mean, like as an outsider, I've never been to Australia. I want to go. I think my wife has been to New Zealand, but um, like, is there anything that's like very common there? Well, we didn't actually have barbecue in Australia until in the last few years, really, because oh, if okay. you think about it, the method itself is connected to American history. So whether it's hog pits in Carolina, offset smokers in Texas, um, it's not, it's not a style of cooking that they had in Australia. It's a uniquely American style of cooking. They also don't really do that in Europe. Um, and so we, we didn't have it. We had sort of griddles that we would use as if you invited people around for a barbie, maybe a kettle grill, if you were lucky. Uh, and so it's just taken off. And because of that, the slaughter age was different in Australia. So we were harvesting animals much younger. The genetics were different. The carcasses were much smaller and we followed the British style of butchery. So everything's different. So what is that British style of butchery? Just the cuts being different. So for example, mm. um, you know, first of all, the names are different. This is something that fascinated me in the beginning as well. It was, it was like, hang on, why does it have a different name? Why can't it be called the same thing? It's really difficult to understand as a lay person how a carcass can't be standardized across countries. So yeah, you could get a brisket, but it was a completely trimmed and rolled brisket flat. Um, most pork in Australia is, is sold skin on as, it, as is the British style. So you can do a proper pork roast on a Sunday kind of thing mm -hmm. with crackling. So when I say that the British style, that's what I mean, the cuts 
and, and styles of cuts uh, take take a cue from the British way of butchery. Oh, okay. That, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, the more I... I mean, I'm kind of like you, I, or at least like, like, like you were, I, I can't remember all the different cuts of meat that come from different parts of a cow. Like all my friends know me as the ag guy. And I'm like, you know, I can't remember where the T-bone come from or, or the sirloin and all that good stuff. So I've got to get to there. I, I mean, that, maybe the, that Gerber knife is something I definitely need to have on my person at all times. <laughs> but um, yeah, so you're talking about the skin on. When I first got into smoking, the first thing that I tried was uh burnt ends and so i went to the store and i bought pork belly Mm -hmm. just a big old slab of it when i took it home i was like what are these things on the oh oh these are the nipples on the pig okay this is new and so that was really cool that was just kind of i don't know i I should have saved that to make like some cracklings out of it but i cut it all off and i tried the burnt ends they were good but i want to try the recipe that you shared a couple weeks ago on your instagram which is you put them in the air fryer Mm -hmm. and they seem totally different but they seem delicious oh yeah oh yeah so they they end up doing Mm. i I also do the skins in the air fryer and turn them into cracklings that way Um, okay yeah yeah. so that's a that's a great use the air fryer has really uh really allowed us to live our best crispy lives in this day and age um (laughs) i i ended up doing the pork belly in the air fryer and it turns it much more into like a chinese char siu style it's definitely a little bit chewier rather mm-hmm. than soft and melty but i'm also someone who really loves texturing meat. like i'm not afraid of sirloin i'm not afraid for steak to have a little bit of chew i frequently don't order filet so i'm not afraid of it <laughs> it worked out well in the <laughs> air fryer but i know not everyone likes that you know but i did yeah yeah, I, I feel like that's the trend of, I don't know, the 2020s is the air fryer because everybody's got mm-hmm. one. First it was the Instapot, now it's the air fryer and everybody's air frying stuff. But a friend of ours, he cooked a steak in the air fryer and he says it was delicious. Like he he cut it, it had a little bit of a pink center and it looked pretty good. I was like, I might need to try that. Have you tried that yet? I haven't just because it's, it's a trade-off. Steak cooking is a trade-off <clears throat> most of the time. Um, unless you're really, really good at it or really mm. experienced at it or have it dialed into exactly how you want it. So with the air fryer, the problem is that you're nearly always going to end up overcooking the center to get that crispy outside. Mm. Yeah, um, that makes sense. And to get that Maillard reaction and the converse is, you know, that that's the that's the eternal struggle when it comes to to that. So I, I would give it a shot. I've made deep fried bits of ribeye um, that I've tried from Mexico called ribeye chicharron, like crispy okay. little ribeye bits, and you know, they serve them with guacamole. That's amazing. That sounds super good. I mean, even going off of that, like there's so many trends that I've seen on social media. Like, I mean, do you know Max the Meat Guy on mm-hmm. Instagram and YouTube? Yeah, he he's used to ask big. me for advice way when he oh, started. Oh, no way. Really? Yeah. So he's got like a cool background where he like, he lived in China for a while and he would try all these different recipes of like Peking duck and all this stuff. And I mean, lately he's done some stuff where he, I think he wet aged um, some steaks in wine, whiskey, and I think something else. And he said they're actually pretty good, but it was a lot of wine and a lot of whiskey that you actually had to use. Yeah. Uh, Max does... A lot of his stuff is driven by curiosity, which is what makes Mm. us better people to kind of challenge and push the envelope. Um, But his account has grown so big that I would classify what he does now as entertainment. Um, Mm. So when I create a recipe, I am assuming that many, many people are going to try that recipe. And if it fails, I'm going to hear about it. And then people aren't going to continue to follow me. Um, Whereas, so... (laughs) I have to kind of focus the different focus on that than kind of just, you know, a TV show on your phone where it's like gluing oh, yeah. a pork belly to a brisket. Um, because it, it, you know, people will be like, Oh my God, did you see this? <laughs> and so, you know, I've done a lot of stuff with dry and wet aging too. And I think it's neat that Max running all, all those experiments um, from the science background, he doesn't ever, do things more than once because it's kind of like there's no point from the entertainment sake so we don't really know yeah. if they can be recreated and it's just his opinion but um you know I, I think i think it's 
fun to push that envelope. It's just, I'm certainly not, I'd rather have wine in a glass next to my steak, you know? <laughs> so I think recognizing the difference in this day and age with, with creators and influencers and what's being done for entertainment value and what's being done as sort of an information sharing is, is different. That's pretty good. And I mean, even even talking about that, I feel like the barbecue crowd online are very, very sensitive about their view of what barbecue is, because everybody does it differently, whether it's, you know, the Carolinas or Kansas City. I mean, you might say, oh, hey, mayonnaise is a good binder for for your rub. And then Mm -hmm. some people are like, absolutely not. You have to use mustard. And I mean, I'm sure there's so much that goes into it. Like when you an experiment, like do you ever worry about a this crowd is going to say this, or this crowd is going to say that, or you're just like, I just want to experiment and see what happens. Um, I don't usually post the, I mean, first of all, at the end of the day, it's all our own individual channels. So we can just do whatever the heck we want. Right. And, and the cool thing about barbecue is even though there was that really like regional fight way back when it really has changed a lot. So you can find great barbecue all over the world now. And they pick from the best. So you can walk into, mm. uh, you know, hometown barbecue in Brooklyn and get the best of Texas brisket and the best of Vietnamese inspired ribs and, you know, the best Carolina style pulled pork and you're eating it in Brooklyn. And in Texas, we're starting to see big influences in the Houston area. There's a lot of Asian in- inspired barbecue, Blood Brothers barbecue, Curry Boys, we're seeing a lot of Vietnamese influence. We're seeing a huge Tex-Mex influence. Uh, people making their own tortillas using smoked brisket tallow. Corn elotis with brisket that's been smoked. It's more awesome to see things changing and morphing and, and turning into new versions of itself. So... I think that the days of things being like, this is the only way to do it are done, <laughs> especially with the rise of pellet grills. There are still people who call them, you know, hasty bakes, uh, sorry, easy bake ovens. Hasty bakes is an actual grill company. They make great grills. <laughs> easy bake ovens of the, of the smoker world. But the reality is it's made that style of cooking accessible for mm. so many people. And why shouldn't we all just celebrate it rather than try and be exclusive? That's true. I mean, the pellet smokers are so cool because obviously you can monitor it on your phone. You don't mm-hmm. have to watch it. I mean, right now I've got a vertical smoker. And so I'm still trying to learn how to maintain the, the the temperature and the smoke and all that stuff. But with the pellet grills, it's so easy and it does it almost basically for you. And you can have great meat that you don't really, I don't know, you don't have to baby it because, you know, it's kind of digitally controlled. And so like you're saying, it's cool that more people can access that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. and I guess kind of like have their own spin. Exactly. Exactly. It just makes it more accessible. I think it's neat. And it means that there's more creativity flowing around it too. Yeah, that's true. And I haven't really thought about it, but I mean, you know, so many people are moving to Texas, like Austin, Houston, wherever. And I mean, Texas, Kansas are kind of like the melting pot of barbecue really. And so it's cool that it's kind of exploding and you're seeing so many different types of barbecue in all those different areas. Definitely. Definitely. And that the general standard is being raised too. Yeah, that's true. And speaking of Texas, I'm assuming that you've been to Franklin's. Yes. That is on, I've been to Salt Lake, but Franklin's is on my bucket list. I really, really want to go to Franklin's. I had a, I had some friends that went out there and they tried it and they said it was delicious. The line was long, but it was delicious. Yeah. So that's on my bucket list. Yeah. It's always great, great eating there for sure. But I will say there are a lot of great restaurants in Austin. So great barbecue restaurants in Austin. So you're very spoiled for choice here. Oh no, I can imagine. So you're, you're super busy. You've got your Instagram, you have got also hardcore carnivore. So tell us a little bit more about hardcore carnivore. Yeah, I'm actually on all of the social media platforms. So that's kind of exhausting. Um, I, uh, in 2016, I had an idea to put out a seasoning as kind of an extension of, all right, everyone tries my recipes, but how can I get them to taste what I think steak should taste like at home? And I had this concept Mm -hmm. for a seasoning that had activated charcoal in it. So it would turn the meat black before you've even cooked it. And that helped me as I started to learn to cook meat because I, I felt like the choice was always, are you going to overcook it or do you want a great crust? And so this sort of worked like a cosmetic for me where I got a great visual sear, but I wasn't tempted to overcook it, you know? And Mm -hmm. that, that was the concept of it. But at the end of the day, it just tastes really good. I think that's why it's done well for itself. 
So I launched that in 2016, not really thinking much more than like, it's going to be a sort of little bonus piece of merch to what I was doing every day. And now we are here in 2023. There's 10 flavors in the lineup. We have a full range of grilling accessories like disposable cutting boards and butcher's paper and high heat gloves. We're stocked um, all over the US, North America, in Australia, UK, Scandinavia, Mexico. So here we are. It's all over the place. That's awesome. Yeah, I've seen it so much. I mean, there's so many chefs out there that use it. And I mean, I've seen so many people. There's another brand out there. I think they call their charcoal like dirt or something or like Southern dirt or something. But um, yeah, I love the the taste of a good crust on there, but you've got to have a good balance, whether it's like, you know, just searing it quickly or overcooking it. But it's good that you were like, hey, let's have a seasoning that gives you all those benefits. It tastes really good and it tastes like a really good crust. Definitely. I mean, so to be clear, the activated charcoal doesn't taste like anything. It's actually odorless and flavorless. It, mm. But, you know, we eat mm. with our eyes, which is why you bother plating things, not just dumping it all into a trough and feeding it to <laughs> ourselves like pigs. So it sort of helps with that visual um, color contrast as well. But we that came out in 2016, and it was definitely the one that made activated charcoal rubs popular. So you'll you'll uh, you'll see a lot of copycats and offshoots from the OG. <laughs> I bet. Yeah. I bet it's pretty cool to be the original trendsetter. Every time you see it, you're like, yeah, I'm the one that came up with that. You're all copying me. That's yeah, pretty good. That's it's, a, it's a good compliment. It is. It's a great compliment, but you know, we're lucky enough that our customers keep coming back because of, you know, the other flavors in our line and also the taste too. Yeah. So when you're developing a flavor, like what all goes into that? Are you thinking about um, like, oh, I want to make something that's just specifically for a chicken, for example, like for a smoked chicken or something like what all goes into it when you're developing those flavors? So, I mean, obviously we develop them one at a time and I think about what it needs to be. So when I developed black, I knew I wanted it to be primarily for beef um, and then and then red meat because that's what looks great with that black contrast. Obviously the rub is called black. It's, <laughs> it's, I didn't get yeah. so creative. It's just hardcore carnivore black. <laughs> um, and so I knew I wanted to, beef is one of my favorite proteins. It was really important for me to let the meat do the talking. And I wanted to actually give the actual flavor a very understated profile. So all of the, those flavors come in and complement things without overpowering them. That's why there are no mm -hmm. dried herbs in there or anything like that, because mm -hmm. that's a whole different flavor. And so when we went down the line and I would create a new rub, it was like, okay, well, what does this need to be? So the second one we came out with was red because people really liked the flavor profile of black, but it just didn't look good on chicken and pork. Um, it made mm, pork ribs okay. look burnt. So <laughs> we, um, so, you know, I took that concept of like, I said, I know I want this on lighter meats. What should it be? And then we came out with a chili lime and then, you know, a wild game um, lamb rub and, so every time I work on a new flavor, now I think about, because obviously I, I use all of them. I have them all in my spice drawer at home. And now it's like, what's, what's missing? What would I need to reach for that isn't here yet for a recipe? So that's, and then what do I want it to taste like? So for example, you know, we have our own Tex-Mex flavor, which is our own version of a taco and fajita seasoning. And I mm. contacted my manufacturer and I'm like, hey, I'm just letting you know I'm going to start working on a on a taco seasoning. And he's like, okay, we have about 1,500 taco and fajita recipes in the <laughs> database. I'm like, okay, well, you're about to get one more. Um, <laughs> 1,501. Exactly. Because there's just, that. that's the thing. There's, I know what I want it to taste like. And, you know, funnily enough, what the recipe I ended up sending him, which is what I created here at home, He's like, yep, this is different to all the other ones we have. So, you know, I just, I go with my gut. I trust myself and, and I haven't strayed away from the idea of what, what, how, how this all started, which is that I love eating. I love food and I want certain flavors in my, like, I know what I want this to taste like. And that's still the driving force behind creating new flavors. That's awesome. I mean, I feel like when it comes to cooking, there are like, infinite possibilities that you can have even if you're cooking the same thing you can always add different spices or i mean even when it comes to meat like if you're cooking one brisket you cook a regular brisket and then maybe you want to be crazy and you want to cook like an a5 wagyu brisket i mean that's going to be two totally different experiences 
And I mean, you touched on it a, a second ago, um, wild game. Like that's a whole different category of stuff, of cooking, of processing and all that good stuff. So I mean, I feel like, if, I feel like you know, the, the sky's the limit really. And um, speaking of wild game, you you went to Texas and you went hunting a couple weeks ago, right? I think I saw it on your, on your social media. Yes, I'm going again this week too. Nice. So what exactly are you hunting? Uh, right now it's whitetail season, so hunting deer. Okay, nice. Yeah, my, my pa-in-law is a really big time hunter. He hunts, I'm up here in Florida. He is, um, he's hunts in South Alabama mm-hmm. and actually just got a, I think an eight point this weekend. So oh, he's nice. super excited and everything he shoots, he always gets it in the summer sausage and it's like cheese and jalapeno Yum. and it's so good. We put it on the smoker and I had a work party, Christmas party, I think about three weeks ago and I cut them into like little four or five inch little, um, little logs, put them on the grill but it started getting really smoky because the fat was dripping down. Oh, and dang. I was like, oh my God, it's going to taste horrible. It's going to taste burnt. But they tasted so, so was good. It like, amazing? so smoky, so delicious. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, and ev- all my coworkers were like, where did you get this sausage from? I was like, oh, I cooked it. That, yeah. is, that is a Trevor original. <laughs> <laughs> always claim, always claim it where you can. Oh, 100%. But, you know, I love, I feel like people that go out, um, hunt for animals, hunt for wild animals. Um, butcher them, clean them, cook them. I feel like they know so much about the animal, about the butchery process, about really the whole art of meat science and all that than the, than the typical consumer. I mean, I've, and I feel like you've done a really good job of, about educating people on, you know, wildlife, on cooking and all that good stuff. So I think that's always really cool to see online. It's funny you say that because I, I don't know that I would agree. And it's really interesting. I think okay. hardcore hunters have a deeper understanding of it for sure. Mm. But, and, and obviously they have an idea of butchery that goes without saying there are people who eat meat from the grocery store that won't refuse to handle it raw, you know? So Mm -hmm. certainly being a hunter is definitely an extension of that. And I, I have broken down all the animals that I've taken. I only started hunting when I moved to Texas seven, eight years ago. And so I'm still in a position where I've, I've broken down every deer, you know, from, <laughs> from field all the way through to vacuum sealing in my freezer myself. Not everyone does that. And if you don't have someone to teach you, that can be the biggest barrier to entry as well. So I totally understand that. And it's obviously easy to drop a deer at a processor here in Texas and let them do the work. Um, I think that there's a lot of stuff that hunters do that they don't think about while they do it. They just do it. Mm. and think that it makes a difference so from the science perspective um it's also really difficult because we we have meat science you know i ended up going to school at iowa state and completing a meat meat science graduate program which is why i'm why i'm such a nerd about it (laughs) you know we can get into such specific details in slaughter of you know we, we know details on the breeds we know exactly how how long they should be held if they should be given food and water in that period before slaughter what happens from the second they're knocked or dispatched to exsanguinated, how long that takes, like inspection of the carcass. The control is a huge part of the meat safety and quality, and you have none of that in hunting. So mm-hmm. even the idea, you know, from a taste perspective, bleeding out an animal as they do in a slaughterhouse, like if you knock a, a beef animal, you're you're cutting its throat and bleeding it out within a within 60 seconds of that knock you know getting it up on the chain and starting to bleed it out because you want to cool that carcass down you want to remove that blood it's going to make big taste differences well when you go and hunt a deer first of all if you're backcountry hunting and you shoot it three miles away you know (laughs) you got to hike into that thing and go get it or even if you're shooting it at a feeder, like we do often here in Texas, you know, the way that I got taught and still everyone's like, you just give it 10 minutes just in case. So even if mm-hmm. you think you killed it, like just let it in case it's dying, let it expire in peace without feeling any pressure on it. Well, that 10 minutes makes a tremendous amount of quality difference to our meat too. Um, and, and a lot of people don't realize that or think about it. And I always like, I'm, I'm often asked to be a podcast on like some hunting, a podcast guest on hunting shows. And, you know, a lot of hunters are like, I know where my meat comes from. And I'm like, well, I know <laughs> where it came from too. Here's the establishment number. But more so than that, I think it's funny when I say to them, I'm like, so you'll hike out into the pristine Nebraskan wilderness 
or Montana, wherever they're hiking at, the Alaska, I don't care. And when you're out there, you'll use purification tablets for your water. Because even though you're out in organic nature, the water can kill you. Like, Mm -hmm. what makes you think the meat is any different? Like, why do we have this idea that meat in the wild is safe, but water in the wild, that's okay to treat? I like, I haven't really thought about that, but you know, that's true. I'm like, you can even get those straws that filter out the water for you, but you know, we're going to, you know, shoot a a deer that's been out in Wyoming by itself. That's in nature and we're, that's safe, but the water's not. That's interesting. Yeah. So, because obviously animals carry disease and and most people, Mm -hmm. again, hardcore backcountry hunt is a little different. They know to check the the liver for flukes and the heart and things like Mm -hmm. that. And they'll, they'll know a little bit more about that. But especially like domestically here, you know, hunting in South Alabama, hunting in Texas, you don't know that that animal's organic. You don't know if it's be, if it's been allowed to roam. You don't know that it hasn't been eating pesticide treated treated crops down the road at the neighbors. You don't know anything about that animal or where it came from, actually, or what mm-hmm. it's been eating. So I just find that amusing. <laughs> That is that is interesting. I haven't really thought about that yet, but you're talking about the taste differences. So what? Let's get nerdy here. Like yeah. the the meat the meat science behind it. Like why exactly is it going to taste a little bit different versus if something's going to bleed out really quickly versus you know you shoot a deer and it dies of natural causes. Like what's going to be the main cause there? So we, with the bleeding out, the main thing is that the blood is going to have flavor, and as it oxidizes, it effectively rusts. That's the heme part of the hemoglobin, um, and and what gives meat its color is myoglobin that also has like an iron component that changes. Basically, why meat goes brown from red when it turns off is it's kind of the same as rusting, which is kind of cool to think about it that way. Um, okay. But it does have an off flavor, so if you can't drain the blood out which has to happen soon, it's going to affect the flavor. If you, from a, there's also a water holding capacity um, aspect and tenderness. So if you can get that carcass cooling down by removing the blood, there's an ideal like chart of the rate that the carcass cools versus the pH level dropping. And there's a green zone that it needs to follow for the ideal water holding capacity before that, that animal hits rigor. Otherwise you can end up with, it, it can expel a lot of water. It doesn't hold a lot of water in the steaks, um, ends up being really dry meat, ends up being mm. really watery on the surface when you go to cut it rather than being internal. Um, and, and spoilage as well. Uh, you know, if you're not getting to it quickly enough and that carcass is heating up or it's not cooling quickly enough, you can already start the, the decomposition process and, and oxidation spoilage. Yeah, that's interesting. I haven't really thought about kind of the flavor differences between that. And I mean, I had when I, was, I went to the University of Florida and I had one meat science class and it was cool. We dissected chickens and that mm-hmm. was mind blowing. We, I think the, the, the third day we went and saw beef cattle get processed. And then the fourth day we saw swine get processed mm. and it was like eight o'clock in the morning and we're watching. I was like, this is crazy, but this is very <laughs> cool and very informative, but yeah. it's a little bit too early in the morning for this, but <laughs> that was neat. Um, so in terms of, let's say cooking, do you have any of your favorite cooking hacks or barbecue hacks that maybe change the game when it comes to cooking some great tasting cuts of meat oh man you know it's hard to think down to a single one i guess <laughs> my signature move when it comes to grilling would probably be what i call jkf or just keep flipping and that's just mm, okay. something that i found myself naturally doing so i'm the person who believes in flipping your steak frequently but there are a few things that have to happen for that to work so the steak has to be over an inch and a half thick or over an inch and a quarter thick you have to have very, very high heat source. So most in stoves in our homes won't cut it. Restaurant stoves will. Just that BTU mm. output, very different. Um, if it's a grill, I'll have it at like 450 plus at least of concentrated heat. And I keep the steak moving over and over. And yes, it looks pretty crappy the first few times that I flip it. 
but it does start drying that surface, which allows the Maillard reaction to happen. That's the stuff that makes that browning on the crust. It's the stuff that makes brown butter smell good. It's the stuff that makes browning bread smell good in the oven. And so it that happens in the absence of water. So as we mm. dry out the surface and you keep moving it over the direct heat, you'll start to see a crust build for sure. And that way, you know, there's another method called reverse sear where the idea is you just cook at a really low temperature. So whether that's a sous vide or a smoker or even in the oven, and then you just finish with a one minute sear really quickly and you get a perfect edge to edge pink in the middle, but it takes like an hour to do on a, yeah. on a one inch steak. And so the just keep flipping method, you get a great crust, you get a great edge to edge pink, but it'll be ready in like 15 minutes. And I don't like yeah, waiting to eat. I get hangry. I don't know about you. Oh, yeah. I mean, I can't cook a steak for an hour because you're going to smell it. And you're like, I have to cook this thing for an hour. Yep. No, thank you. But <laughs> I've seen a, I've seen a lot. Of, maybe you're the trendsetter on this again. But I've seen a lot of people lately that are OK with flipping it a bunch. Like if it's a bigger steak, because it used to be like you flip it once and then that's it. I know mm -hmm. that's that's what a lot of people say about burgers. But I mean, it seems like more people are getting comfortable with like, you know, flipping a steak a lot because you can develop that really, really good crust. Mm -hmm. And I mean, before I forget about it, this is another Max the Meat Guy thing. He did a recipe a few weeks ago where he um, seasoned a steak with steak crust from a previous steak. And it, he said it had like the thickest crust and it was super, super juicy and super good. I was like, might need to try that sometime soon. It sounded really good. It was like extra crusty, but like, like a very good crusty, I guess. I don't think it would be any different than taking brisket bark. And I did see that video. I think it's just one of those, like, I would, I am never going to go into my house and cook a steak in order to keep steak crumbs to then put on the <laughs> steak. Um, and, and really, if I break it down just from a logical perspective, all it's doing is it's protecting the inner meat. So you're giving yourself a buffer zone. Mm -hmm. right because now you have a physical external layer that you're just looking to char and sear um and and it's still meat so yeah it has the capacity to take on on extra flavors like that i just i remain skeptical let's put it that <laughs> it's a lot way. of work yeah no i don't blame you i don't blame you. i don't know if i'll ever try it but i saw that i was like okay that's a thing that's interesting um so this is something i love to ask anybody in food and farming there's this huge debate on grass fed versus grain fed food. So, or, or, or meat. So from your perspective, what are the differences there? Grain fed versus grain or grass fed versus grain. Are there a lot of taste differences? What are your thoughts? There's a big taste difference. That's the main difference. Obviously it's got a different fatty acid complex profile. Um, mm -hmm. And so the way I describe it is it's not that one is better than the other. It's just they're different. And so you need to figure out what you're looking for. Sometimes mm -hmm. the way I describe it is, you know, it's like one not one is not better or worse. So mm -hmm. one is just one is is good and one is good for you. Plus this added vitamin, let's say, which would be grass fed. It has a couple of extra bits and pieces in it from the feed that are extra benefits, but it doesn't mean that grain fed is detrimental, if that makes sense. Right, yeah. So um, obviously there's a huge difference in taste um, and gra grass fed can tend, for lack of a better word, to be gamier. So mm -hmm. it has a truer, truer richness of flavor, I suppose, whereas the fattiness associated with grain fed allows it to be a little more mild. Um, but that's preferred by a lot of people. A lot of people don't like a gamey flavor. And I think that's why grain fed beef, especially has allowed to be become so successful in the United States. It's obviously it works for, for both sides when the consumer is willing to, to accept it. And it's easier for the industry to get the calves to or get the animals to market weight quicker. Yeah, that's really good. I mean, I've heard a lot of people, it used to be like people thought that grass fed was healthier than grain fed, but then it started, people started to learn more, you know, from the experts that, you know, it's just a difference in raising, like you're going to have different tastes with them. Mm -hmm. They're both totally fine. They're both super healthy. It's all up to you. Like you're just going to have like some difference in, in, um, in taste. And I heard one argument, I forget who it was. I think they were on the show, but they were saying, you know, some people give 
um, grain fed like a negative taste or a negative taste because it's grain. Mm. When we have A5 Wagyu that's fed grain and that's like the top tier beef, but we just kind of ignore that. So I thought right. that was pretty interesting. I mean, right. I mean, Wagyu is, that's something I haven't cooked yet with, but I've had Wagyu tacos, Wagyu brisket, so much Wagyu and it's so good, but I have got to try some one day. Yeah. And you know, it's totally different. Obviously when we say Wagyu in the U S you're we're probably talking about American Wagyu. So Wagyu mm -hmm. that's 50% crossed with another breed, usually Angus. And when you have full blood Japanese Wagyu, that's like, crazy a5 marbled that's a whole different eating experience it's like trying to compare a mushroom and a, a you know a, a regular mushroom and a porcini mushroom dried mushroom and i don't know maybe i'm, I'm being too nerdy with that comparison but <laughs> it's just like yeah it's the same but it's not at all the same it's actually a completely different product I, for a while there i had a sponsorship from a high-end wagyu company and they were sending out steaks and my husband who He's a born and raised Texan, loves red meat. We were getting those that look more white than pink. Um, oh, okay. The real like showstopper. They were actually imported J Japanese Wagyu, but even though they had a domestic herd too. And he turned around to me one night and it's not like we'd have it often, but I kind of had it, you know, like with th three weeks in a row, steak, not steak night was this Wagyu. And he goes like, please, I, I can't believe I'm saying this, but please, I can't do anymore. I can't, I, mean, I need a break because it's so rich. The way the yeah. Japanese eat it is just a few slices over rice. Um, and, you know, and Americans like a big old one pound ribeye. That's it. Yeah. And I mean, I've seen some, I want to do this. I haven't done this yet at like a Korean restaurant where they cook it on like the little grill that's like right in front of you. Mm -hmm. And they'll do it like a little strip of A5 and just grill it very quickly and then eat it. And then that's it. But yeah, it's like two totally different experiences. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, Super fatty, super rich, super flavorful. But I mean, you have like a big old steak. I mean, I can't imagine cooking like um, a tomahawk steak of A5 Wagyu. Yeah, and that, that, would, would be, that would be ridiculous. It honestly would get to the point where it would be <clears throat> cumbersome to get through. <laughs> yeah, after like bite five or six, you're like, okay, this is a lot, but mm -hmm. I've eaten like maybe 10% of this tomahawk steak. Like there's so much more to go. Right. <laughs> So I also love that you share some great things about like some lesser known or less like less popular cuts of meat. One thing I really want to try, you did a beef tongue taco that I really, really want to try. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, I feel like a lot of people have like a lot of, I don't know, they don't want to try something like that, but obviously it's delicious. So should we get over our negative connotations with various cuts of meat and just try it? Yeah, definitely. I think that there are some of them that are still a little confronting. Like I don't love organ meat personally it's a textural mm -hmm. thing for me but for but the, the tongue is tongue is a muscle so technically it's just like an extension of a steak um once you take the taste buds off uh. yeah <laughs> i mean what what like, like you said i mean you boil it right and then you take the taste buds off then right. it looks like a normal steak <laughs> exactly and it, it just it it's nearly like a brisket and it's makeup it's very fatty it's very gelatinous so when you mm -hmm. it's very tough because obviously it gets used a lot but when you cook it to tender, um, you can also then crisp it up. So I love, you know, boiling it or smoking it till tender and then finishing it on a griddle or plancha. It's just mm. give it nice and crispy. It's, uh, it's really good stuff. And I think that oftentimes if we're served it without being told what it is and we can do that without any um, preconceived notions, that's a great way to do it. But having said that, I still don't love like liver and mollejas and... <laughs> you know, glands and stuff like that. So I get it. Yeah, I want to try. Um, I really want to try a liver one day. I haven't really tried it. Um, I mean, I'm not talking like liver king levels, <laughs> but um, I really want to try like some liver tacos or some heart. I've, I've seen a lot of people that swear by heart, especially um, by like like deer, deer mm -hmm. heart. Like you just cut it up, make a little taco out of it. It seems really good. Like I want to try that. But again, I just want to do like the main organs. I don't want to do anything crazy, any glands or kidneys or anything like that. <laughs> nah, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I think that's fair enough. I've done deer heart a couple times and you know, it, it's, I think the trick is it, it has such a small window for being delicious. And then if it gets too mm -hmm. tough, it's really tough eating, pardon the pun. 
So <laughs> it does, it does a lot of those, a lot of those weird cuts take the right cooking to be palatable too. Yeah, that's true. I mean, a little bit too long or a little bit not enough. It's not going to be nearly, that's what, I mean, that's the cool thing about, about smoking that I'm trying to still figure out. Like you've got to smoke it the right temperature for just the right amount of time. So you can get just the right cut or I mm-hmm. mean, you can get just the right taste. Mm-hmm. It's fun. Like it's fun to nerd out about. I mean, I have not perfected it in any way, shape or form, but I mean, you fail, you still get a really good piece of meat, which right. is not bad at all. Yes. Right? So, you know, as you're planning out, like what goes through planning out all this content, planning out all the recipes, collaborating with people, like how do you manage all that? Because I'm, I'm sure that's kind of a lot to manage. Um, well, what you can see is I have a bunch of post-it notes and stickers and notes <laughs> all over my desk, uh, which helps. Um, I try and take notice. Uh, it's a couple of things. So I try and just think of recipes that I would be mm. interested in. You try and disperse it with cuts, you know, that people are interested in. Like you can't mm. talk about brisket too much. You can't talk about steak too much. Um, but if I talked about tongue tacos every day, I might start to lose, you know, a little bit of audience share. And then just also trying to pay attention to what other people are doing within reason. I find it a little, I find it quite difficult to follow too many people because I find that it muddles with my own creativity. So I like Mm. to kind of be unfettered and not overly influenced, but I still paying attention. I do a lot of meat and myth busting videos. So I keep an eye out for, for those. And a lot of people send me links too, which is pretty funny. (laughs) Um, So there are ways around it for sure. Yeah. Those are fun. I mean, what are some, uh, what are some of those videos that you've done? Like the meat bit, the meat myth busting videos that you've done lately. We, there was, um, sometimes there'll be myth busting other people's videos and sometimes it'll just be explaining to people. So I frequently talk about the color of meat and how the liquid in the packaging is not blood. Mm. Um, I, I, you know, I just did another one about pork parasites. There's an old wives tale about people pouring pork, uh, Coca-Cola onto pork and that it makes all these worms crawl out of it. And they either digitally enhance them or there's nothing there. And, you know, so you kind of stitch with that or someone who buys like a fast food chicken sandwich that's restructured chicken. And they're like, what the hell is this? This ain't chicken. It's like, well, it is chicken. But if you only want to spend a dollar on your sandwich, let me explain to you why that's chicken and how it got to be that way. And it doesn't mean that it's gross. Um, persistent pinking is something that happens a lot in burgers, like where you think you've cooked the burger all the way through and you have, but it's still pink in the middle. And we see that often in some fast food as well. So I just like, I like taking everything that I have learned and sharing it with other people. I find it so empowering to understand what you're looking at, what you're eating, what you're dealing with. And I feel better when I create content, whether it's recipes or meat myth busting, that serves a purpose on the internet beyond just entertainment. Yeah. And I mean, I feel like there's so many, I don't know, misinformation videos out there when it comes to to meat, to cooking, to food, that some people are just making because they're curious, they want an answer. And also some people that are just malicious and they're just doing it to, you know, go viral and to get all the views. Mm. And so that's awesome that you're like educating and trying to show like, oh, hey, this is what's going on or this isn't real. So I feel like we need a lot more people like that that are doing exactly what you're doing and like kind of educating people really when it comes to food and when it comes to meat. Because obviously, unfortunately, there's a lot of people out there saying that we shouldn't be eating meat, that we should be eating these highly processed, you know, impossible burgers and everything mm. like that. And so mm. I feel like we need a lot more people highlighting the importance of meat, how healthy it is for our diets and all that good stuff. Yeah, definitely. I agree. Yeah. Well, Jess, this has been awesome. If people want to follow you, obviously you're on all the social medias. You've got Hardcore Carnivore. Where all can they go to see you, to buy your products and to learn from you? Uh, well, Hardcore Carnivore is just literally hardcore carnivore on all the socials and hardcorecarnivore.com. I'm under my own name. So Jess Priles, J-S-S-P-R-Y-L-E-S on there's pretty much no social media platform that I'm not on except for <laughs> OnlyFans. That's that I'm not on. <laughs> we'll talk about that another time. No, I'm kidding. Um, and my website's jesspriles.com. Lots of free recipes there. Uh, and I'd love for you guys to check out my content and let me know what you think. Yeah, your content is always top-notch. 
Um, I'm for real gonna try your burnt ends in the air fryer sometime very, very soon. When I do, I will tag you. So I'm awesome. very excited for that. <laughs> awesome, good deal. And don't throw your skins away. I do chicken skins and pork skins in there too. Yes, I will keep them. I'm try. That's one thing I want to do this year. I want to learn more about how to, you know, use all the cuts of meat. Like make some cracklings. I love chicharrones. They're my favorite. Zero mm, carbs. Mm -hmm. Love chicharrones. They're so good. But I will definitely do that. Good. Justice. This has been so fun. Thanks so much for being on. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Trevor.